support for the nonprofit lab comes from respect, a feeling of deep admiration for someone or something elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. Give it to yourself and share it with others where it's due. Respect. Welcome to the Nonprofit Lab, a podcast dedicated to the ongoing discovery of how we can all be a part of bigger social change through the lens of the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Puya Porak. I'm an industrial engineer, human-centered designer, and CEO of MatchNice, a social impact tech startup with a mission to connect the nonprofit ecosystem and maximize social impact. Thanks for joining us on our startup journey as we look to uncover and shake up the status quo in the world of nonprofits. On today's episode, I have the opportunity to dive deep into the world of insurance with Pamela Davis, CEO of a group of cooperative nonprofit insurers known as the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance, or NIA. Pamela was featured in a PBS documentary and sequel, part of the Visionary series. She received the first ever award for policy innovation from the Goldman School of Public Policy, UC Berkeley. She was named one of the nation's 15 best bosses by Fortune Small Business and Winning Workplaces, named by Business Insurance as one of the 80 women to watch and an elite woman by Insurance Business America, and was twice listed as a nonprofit Times Power and Influence Top 50. She holds a bachelor's with highest honors in economics from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a master's in public policy from the University of California, Berkeley. In this episode, we discuss and navigate the technicalities of insurance for the nonprofit sector while spending time discussing the heart of what socially conscious leadership looks like. We'll cover a brief history of insurance on the nonprofit sector, recent shifts in coverage availability for nonprofits, policies that all grassroots nonprofits should consider, the importance of challenging status quo systems, and conscious leadership in a capitalist market economy. Here's my conversation with Pamela. Pamela Davis, welcome to the Nonprofit Lab. How are you? Well, thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you so much for being on the show to talk all about insurance and the nonprofit <laughs> sector, which I'm actually really intrigued by because uh, one of the first ideas for Match Nice was all like actually around how might we help connect service providers, mm -hmm. really, really good service providers to nonprofits. And um, based on everything I've read and see, the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance is one of the best, if not the best nonprofit insurance provider out there. Tell us, tell us about your journey into the nonprofit sector, which I know spans almost 30 plus years now, um, and your journey with the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance. Sure. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let's, let's go from there. So it started back really in the mid 80s where I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley and I had done some work with the Senate Office of Research about the insurance crisis that was facing the US at that time. And uh, the nonprofit sector that I had worked with prior to that came to me, some of the folks and said, we just can't get insurance. It is horrible out there and we can't continue to get our grants. We can't do our service if we can't get insurance. And so I decided that I would do my graduate thesis on this topic of the nonprofits particularly and their difficulties that they have with insurance and why and proposed that nonprofits really will only get long-term stability in their insurance if they take the risk themselves and create their own insurance companies. And, and so that's what I did. And, and, and what's, what's unique about your model is that 
the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance is a nonprofit. Exactly. Oh. And the story, the it's a long story to have gotten there because when I first started, it was a risk pool in California that was under state law. And we still, uh, that's the company still exists. But um, we, we started with a half a million dollar loan for capital uh, for an insurance company, which is kind of crazy. If you look back and you think, oh my gosh, you were basically in debt to start. And uh, 40,000 in the bank. We'd been funded by a few foundations, including Ford and Irvine and Packard. And I think everybody wanted a solution to this really bad problem. They were really nervous that we would not make it. And I think there was a lot of people who really doubted that we were going to be successful and trying to raise money. It was very clear when I met with foundations, most of them turned me down and said, are you crazy? Nonprofits shouldn't get into the insurance business. So it was not like it was welcome with open arms, but those who funded this uh, when we started out, I think were at wit's end. They didn't have any other solution. So let's try this. And I know the Ford Foundation did a study and told me that we won't fund you unless the study concludes that having nonprofits own their own insurer really is the only long-term solution. So, so I started and, um, you know, it was a struggle. As I say, the first 10 years were the hardest, but it was a long struggle. Um, we uh, believe that nonprofits were less risky than the insurance data demonstrated, but we all we had was really kind of a gut feeling. And so, um, we worked, you know, within the insurance industry with all of the actuaries and the, you know, the, the statistical people that you need to do. And it took them literally 10 years to believe our actual results. Every year, I would say, we're actually performing better than your statistics. And they would say, oh, it's going to blow up anytime. You need to prepare for more claims, put more money up for more claims. So we did that every year for 10 years. And then they said, oh, actually, you're right after all. <laughs> and then uh, our financials showed that we were basically pulling down these, you know, these reserves that we had set aside to pay claims that we didn't have to pay. And that was kind of a turning point for us. Um, and it was the same time that we started getting asked for uh, from other states, from nonprofits in other states. Well, it seems like you're successful here in California, but... What about, what can you do for us in other states? And turns out we had to create a completely separate company because of the way that insurance law is in this country. And it, it is, uh, these two companies together are called Nonprofits Insurance Alliance, but it's Nonprofits Insurance Alliance of California in California and Alliance of Nonprofits for Insurance, a risk retention group outside of California, okay? So we had to create the separate structure and a separate company to oversee the management of it. These two, these actually we have three companies. Um, and so, but for that company, the one outside of California, I said, you know, we can't do this on a half a million dollar loan. We did it. We survived. We paid the loan back, but it was really tough. Mm -hmm. And so I actually raised um, $10 million for the next company. And it was actually not uh, loans, but it was actually grants. And it was 5 million from the uh, Gates Foundation and 5 million from the Packard Foundation. And um, that is what the money was used. Uh, as you know, probably insurance companies have to set aside surplus. We call it uh, capital. We call it surplus in the insurance industry. But that is in case you know your best estimates fail to be correct. You have to have your own reserve of free cash to be able to pay for those claims. And so that was the reason for raising that $10 million from the Gates and Packard Foundations. And where is the where does the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance stand today in terms of the number of states that you're in, how many nonprofits sure. you're serving? Sure. Well, this year we're probably going to cross the 300 million in premium uh, threshold. And it's uh, been very interesting. And I can talk more about this later, but 
we've had a crisis again. It's like deja vu, Groundhog Day all over again, which I thought would never quite happen, but it's been a very interesting last three years. But we now have about 300 million in premium between the two companies and about roughly 250 million in that free surplus I mentioned. Uh, and that's from earnings uh, from nonprofits uh, over, over the years and from uh, interest on our other holdings. And so we insure about a little bit more than 25,000 nonprofits across the country in 32 states right now. Wow. And um, I absolutely want to come back to the pandemic and how that affected business. But I want to go back to the fact that it took 10 years for you to quote unquote, prove the model, even though you had the data year after year to show that mm -hmm. what, you know, to me, you represent someone who fundamentally challenged the status quo of how the insurance industry works within the nonprofit sector. Um, and you, you said that you had a lot of naysayers. What was it that you positioned that was so drastically different than what other insurance companies were doing at the time mm -hmm. and the kinds of reactions that you had. And how did you manage to kind of hold on to that um, through, throughout the years yeah. and with that belief? Yeah. Good point. You know, I think it was two. Th First of all, I think what managed us uh, managed to help me survive was one really good people working with me, um, a belief in myself that I was right. And then also a real belief in the nonprofit sector that I thought that they were really totally misunderstood by the commercial world, the for-profits, even donors. You know, they they don't understand how sophisticated nonprofits are. And I was really adamant that nonprofits are much better risk than they're painted out to be um, by the insurance industry. Some of the areas that we really depart from uh, how insurance is provided by commercial carriers are things like, uh, we actually look for coverage. Now, when, when there's a claim, and I've said this in rooms of insurance executives and they actually gasp. Um, uh, one of them actually blurted out, you'll never survive with that philosophy. And I said, well, back then I said, it's been 30 years, <laughs> you know, it's managed. <laughs> But we actually look for coverage. And that means when we have a claim, you know, we take a hard look and see if we can, if the language of the policy will allow us to cover this within the wording of the policy, rather than, you know, trying to figure out how we can wiggle out of it. Mm. And insurance companies have kind of all the big guns, right? Because they have all the attorneys and it's much easier to to wiggle out than to have a nonprofit hire a you know firm and then try to fight it out. That's you know that's expensive. So we really try to find coverage. And I know from talking to brokers that they say you know you've covered claims that no other company would cover um, because we know that nonprofits themselves have to cover it if we don't. Now that doesn't mean we cover every claim. If it's clearly not covered, if the coverage wasn't purchased, if it's something outside of coverage, we have to deny it. But we really try to make sure that we're very fair in what is covered. We also are different because, and I, I'm underwriters are the, the the staff that actually take in the applications and evaluate uh, whether we can underwrite this nonprofit and offer coverage and how we can price it. But what I've been told uh, by many underwriters as they join us is because uh, we tell them, see if you can figure out how to offer coverage, right? If it because you know if you've seen one nonprofit, you've seen one nonprofit. They're all mm -hmm. different. They don't fit in any boxes. And so nonprofits are doing pretty cutting edge, you know, really unusual things. And insurance likes familiar, right? They like to be able to say, oh, I recognize this. This is exactly how much this should cost. So I have underwriters, you know, who say, wow, you know, we're, you're telling me to write everything that I used to decline. And we encourage them to, to be thoughtful and creative and to find ways to offer the coverage rather than to find ways to decline. And I didn't realize, honestly, our first few years, how different that was. 
until we started to hire more underwriters from different companies. And then it became really clear that we were incredibly different in that way. And a large number of uh, the nonprofits that we insure are startups. So startups find it difficult very often to get coverage because they don't have a track record. Mm -hmm. We have not found them to be particularly risky. So uh, secondly, uh, I would say, or thirdly, we we are very different in that, and we could talk about this a little more about the crisis that happened mm -hmm. with the pandemic, but we didn't stop. We have been offering sexual abuse coverage as a policy uh, for 33 years since our inception. And companies seem to come in and out of that coverage, but we have never stopped writing that. We have always continued uh, to stay that uh, stay in that line. And then just one other practice I, I've thought of that really uh, surprisingly disrupted the insurance brokers because we work through insurance brokers and we work with great insurance brokers all over the country. But we discovered, this was many years ago, that we were sending out quotes to the brokers and then, you know, we'd never hear anything back. And then we'd have nonprofits call us and say, my broker said, you know, that they that they ask you for a quote and you never quoted for us. And we said, well, yeah, we did. And that happened enough times that we realized that we're an alternative, we're unusual. And that some of the brokers were just getting a quote to satisfy the nonprofit because they'd requested that they reach out to us, but weren't letting the nonprofit know that we actually issued the quote for them. Yeah. So what we started doing was sending an email, an introductory email, the broker gets copied on it, but to the nonprofit saying, you've been approved for membership. We've issued a quote to your broker, and we just want you to know these things about us that are different because we are unusual and we want you to have these things to consider as you consider whether or not it's, it's the best idea to, to work with us, you know, as you're considering your choices. I honestly, the first week we sent that out and we'd sent it to brokers and warned them that it was going to go out. I got so many angry messages on my answering machine. They were very upset. They said, you know, we decide whether we share the quote, you know, and we don't have to do that. And we don't want you telling the nonprofits that. Um, and I just, I've said to them, others that have, I said, you don't have to work with us. Mm -hmm. Don't send us the quote. If you don't, if you don't want to work with us, but we don't need practice quoting, right? We have a lot of work to do. And we want to work with brokers who understand our value, who like working with nonprofits and will share our quote with the nonprofit. Thanks, Pamela. So many of the points you made demonstrate the word that's in your the name of your company, Alliance. You really are uh, an ally to the nonprofit sector as a nonprofit um, yourself. And and I, I have some other questions about like those differentiators and you know how being a nonprofit allows you to potentially operate in different ways, even though it sounds like a lot of the values and have the behaviors that you mentioned, any nonprofit like insurance broker could adopt, but there, there still seems to be some kind of secret sauce in the way that you've approached this. But let's, let's go to that point that you've brought up a couple of times. There was a surge of nonprofits being dropped by insurance carriers during the pandemic. Tell us what happened and how you all responded. <laughs> yes. And it was, it was not caused by the pandemic, but it was made worse by the pandemic. And so um, just to put this into perspective, you know, we're a 33 year old group of companies and we have grown by 50% in the last three years. That is just tremendous, tremendous growth, especially for an insurance company. And it really resulted from, uh, you know, the sexual abuse claims that have been in the news uh, you know, colleges, universities, um, you know, other uh, sports uh, entities, that sort of thing. And a lot of insurance companies wrote a lot of that coverage and that sexual abuse coverage, and they wrote it for all kinds of entities. We also know that in the preceding maybe three or four years before the pandemic, and we saw this coming, 
we watched as several insurance companies used sexual abuse as a to be a competitive advantage. So for example, they were offering high limits, like up to 10 million of sexual abuse coverage to, to child serving nonprofits at ridiculously low prices, right? And we had brokers come to us and say, you know, we have to move this because they're going to get this really cheap coverage. And we said, it's not sustainable. This will be a backlash, but we just can't do that. It's not that we don't care about the nonprofits is because we do care about nonprofits and we know this is not sustainable. So sure enough, um, as we had the reviver statutes go into place where uh, the states uh, allowed claims to happen from prior years that were not anticipated. And then also there were courts that made determinations. Now, with us, we have always offered a specific sexual abuse coverage form that says this is what's covered. Because when I started, the carriers were uh, not being specific. They had a coverage called general liability. And they would kind of say, well, if sexual abuse is not excluded, it's included. But then they would decide when the claim came in. And I said, that is not fair. We need to lay out in our in terms what's covered and what's not covered. It turns out that ended up being a very smart move because the carriers that offered that non-specific coverage, the courts have now looked back at those policies and said, well, you weren't clear enough that it was excluded. So therefore you're going to cover sexual abuse in that policy, which they never anticipated. But because we excluded it off one policy and offered it specifically with specific limits for a premium, uh, we have discovered that it's, you know, we don't have the same problem these other carriers do. And so by trying to do the right thing, by offering the coverage form, we've actually uh, ended up being in a much better position than other carriers. So I will say one more thing, and that is the claims that we're seeing the large number of are generally not coming from community-based nonprofits. These are high-profile claims where big bureaucracies have kept the lid on reports of sexual abuse, you know, where they're, they're like the Boy Scouts have had this issue where they managed to not let that get down or the Catholic church. Nonprofits, community nonprofits are not like that. When an abuse happens, there's not a big bureaucracy to keep it from being reported. So we believe the nonprofit sector has been unfairly targeted by these carriers that are not renewing them, but that doesn't matter. They're getting non-renewed anyway. Hmm. I'm I'm curious to to understand more about the types of claims that happen in the sector. You've mentioned, sure. you know, sexual abuse is one of the highest uh -huh. profile, uh, scariest right. things that could happen to uh, anyone or a nonprofit. What are some of the other uh, like umbrellas of coverages that right. uh, nonprofits need to think about and claims sure. that you see the most of? Our most frequent claim is auto claim. We insure, I don't know, 20,000 autos across the country. And uh, no matter how much training, people get into auto accidents. And, you know, things are, we have big vans, we have buses, we have, um, you know, 10, 8 and 10, 12 passenger vans, and then just regular vehicles. We also insure even organizations that don't have their own vehicles, but they have uh, employees or volunteers driving on their behalf. There's a coverage called non-owned hired that covers in excess of their own insurance for the auto. So uh, autos are very frequent. Mm -hmm. Another claim that nonprofits have that is infrequent but tends to be large when it happens is social service professional. So the nonprofit was hired to do a service, often, you know, counseling or you know, you know mental health uh, counseling or. Uh, we insure a lot of organizations that oversee foster family agencies or group homes for children or folks with, you know, dual diagnosis or, you know, many other uh, areas where they're very vulnerable clients. And if one of those clients is injured or even killed, you know, because there's always going to be a finger pointing at the nonprofit for that they should have done something different. One of the things that I think interesting to note, for example, with foster families, 
they have higher standard than even normal parents. So there's an expectation that, uh, you know, for example, if there's a claim in a child, a foster family child, you know, happens to run into the street chasing a ball, you know, that can happen to any family. But the nonprofit is, uh, the foster family agency is considered to be held at a higher standard that those kind of things should not happen. It's, it's quite, so it's a, it's a, a it's can be a big risk. Interesting. So, so, but slip and falls, you know, they also have the plain slip and falls, general liability, trip over a sidewalk, fall, yeah. you know, ramp or stairs or not to code, that sort of thing. And what you said you serve a lot of the grassroots nonprofits, those that are just mm -hmm. starting up, um, getting going. What are some of the most common questions or even misconceptions that you hear from those startup nonprofits about insurance as a whole and what they need and what they don't need? Right. Well, first of all, many don't understand the broker relationship because we actually ask them to use a, a broker to help them fill out the application and really learn more about their operation to make sure. And then they get that application to us so that we make sure that somebody is sufficiently asked those questions. So that's one. Uh, they wonder why they have to go to a broker and it's not required by every company, but in our case, we think it's been helpful. So we have the broker relationship. Um, another thing is a lot of particularly small nonprofits think they only need DNO insurance. That's directors and officers because they think they only need to cover the board right now as they're getting started up. And what I often say to someone that has that question is, well, do you have any fundraisers? Oh, yeah, we have fundraisers. And I said, well, what you don't understand on that is that the directors and officers will be covered, but not for claims like bodily injury, injury where someone might fall at a fundraiser, right? Or, or get hurt at a fundraiser, that directors and officers is not gonna cover it at all. It's only for the decisions your board makes, but for actual activities that you host, you need general liability. Now we will also defend the directors and officers, it's not called that, but you need to have coverage, typically general liability and directors and officers. I would even argue in many cases, the general liability is more important than the directors and officers. Interesting. Thanks for broadening my own perspective with with that. Uh, many of our audience um, are those grassroots nonprofits. So mm -hmm. explaining that kind of the gap in the broker relationship where the broker is the individual who's really helping you navigate the entire insurance marketplace and kind of compiling all of the best quotes to you uh, for them. Mm -hmm. Understanding that is is important. And then uh, that's that's also good for like the types of coverage that you might you might need. Um, you're currently offering insurance in 33 different states. What are the challenges that you have for getting to all 50? Sure. We're actually in 32 states, um, but nonetheless, 32, 33. Um, this is the this is a very interesting challenge. And you know, I, I work on very long-term problems. This is something that I've been working on for the last 10 years. Um, so it, it's also a very long-term problem. Uh, and I'll be as uh, clear about this as, as possible. We are actually already registered for all 50 states. And we could, uh, under regulation, be in all 50 states right away. But uh, in California, as I said, we have special legislation in California. We are authorized by that legislation to write liability and property insurance. And for nonprofit organizations, particularly small community-based, Commercial insurance companies, commercial insurance period is offered as a package. The liability and the you know professional and the the uh, property it's just offered together as a package because it's you know tend to be smaller organizations and you don't really need to have the separate policies. So we're operating outside of California under a federal law that was created because of that crisis I talked to you about thirty some years ago. Well, that crisis was in the liability sector primarily, not in the property sector. Mm -hmm. And it was a negotiated solution where co companies wanted to create their own insurance company it's called risk retention groups to, set, to solve this problem where they couldn't get liability in the commercial market. 
But insurance companies pushed back hard because they didn't want the uh, authority for companies to create these insurance companies of their own. So there was a kind of a, a devil's compromise, in, in my opinion. And that was they allowed these risk retention groups like ours, Annie, to write liability, but not property. And that works for the vast majority of big businesses, right? Because they're mostly buying their medical professional from their risk retention group. That's where the problem was. But for nonprofits, the problem, if you have a problem and you can't get sexual abuse or you can't get professional, you have a problem because it's all packaged together, right? So we've been offering um, the liability, the difficult portion of that package policy, and then have other another one other company that's a commercial company offering the property and the auto physical damage, you know, any property damage. Like for example, right now, if a vehicle, we can insure a van full of kids for $10 million in liability coverage, and we're not allowed to offer the coverage to fix the bumper if it backs mm. into something. It's just crazy. But that's the nature of that law. So um, we are the single company that offers it. Uh, we thought the market would develop over time, you know, that other companies would say, oh, here's an opportunity. We can provide this property and auto physical damage to help out to match with the liability for the risk retention group. And uh, but when the company that we're presently working with said to us, you know, you have a great program. We love it. Your experience is good, your losses, but we're going to be changing strategy. So we just want to let you know that we're probably going to move on from this program eventually. And so you need to find options. And we said that makes perfect sense. So we asked our brokers, we did research and we found out nobody offers that coverage. Hmm. and nobody else really wants to start uh, doing it because it's small. I mean, the minimum premium is $250, right? It's it's for small community-based nonprofits. So I realized I had to go to Congress to, to have this law changed. And I thought, oh, this is small. It won't impact really anybody. Nobody's offering this coverage anyway. So of course, you know, we'll get this done because I had worked with Congress in the 90s, because when I started NIAC and first, there was no law to allow any insurance company to be a 501c3. So I spent seven years pursuing Congress to allow us to be a 501c3 nonprofit, right? So I said, I knew it was a hard process, but I was confident we could get it done. So doing the, this next one, what I didn't understand was that the regulators, the insurance regulators, have a philosophical opposition to any federal law. They didn't like the liability risk retention group. And even though this, this coverage is not available in the marketplace, and they know it, they are fighting hard. So I've been fighting against the, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners over a philosophical point, period. They know this is a problem. But they won't, they, they're pushing back and they don't want Congress to allow this to go through because they have a bright line that says this Liability Risk Retention Act that was passed to solve this market problem will never be expanded. So that's where we are. But once we get that through, we will be able to help nonprofits in all 50 states. That's the only thing keeping us from doing it. <laughs> that's, that's incredible that you, you know, some people use the phrase, that'll take an act of Congress to get through. <laughs> but you you actually did that to start uh, the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance. And then, um, you know, it sounds like you have a really inspiring history of also lobbying for other positive and conscious, conscious change in yes. insurance. Uh, what are some other like sector-wide um, changes from a policy perspective, whether it's insurance or not, that you'd like to to see? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I I have to, I guess, preface this by saying, I don't think little changes around the edges will work for our world anymore. I, I mean, I would love to say, oh, you know, if we just get this tweak or that tweak, it would be a big win for the sector. But I'm of the opinion that capitalism hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked. It's brought us to the brink of disaster. 
I mean, look at the weather, uh, look at the floods and the heat, the great heat that is across our country right now. And, and we've been, you know, with capitalism, we've been saying, you know, it, it only matters, you know, how much money you make without regard to what's happening to the environment and to others. And we've just taken a single uh, focus on the individual and what's good for me and how I can get more. And that is not going to work in a world anymore. And so, you know, my, my sense is that nonprofits have had it right all along. Nonprofits have always said, it's about community. We have to focus our efforts on community. We have to raise everybody up at the same time, including all the creatures, not just humans. We have to consider everybody. And that's really the only model that will save us. And so for me, it's, it's trying to get nonprofit sector kind of on equal footing with the for-profit sector. I mean, you know, maybe a cabinet position for the nonprofit sector, representing the nonprofit sector, but we need something, we need a big, we need big change because um, our existing system is not working. That's a, um, that's a bold, bold point uh, to make. And I agree with your assessment that this something in the system is, is not working. One of the interesting points that uh, our previous guest, Nisha Anon, CEO of Dream.org, made is that part of the reason we're not seeing larger wholesale change in the nonprofit sector is because of the way that funding works. Funding is largely restricted to programs and strategies that are existing and there's not really much of a budget to experiment or try new ways of of doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're saying, though, is a little deeper. It's also like creating a larger representation for the nonprofit sector in government, even, mm -hmm. uh, which <laughs> seems like it should be the thing because nonprofits are really acting as the front line for not just providing the band-aid to a lot of our social systemic issues that we have in our country, but also delivering the support and services that uh, our government relies on, uh, whether that's hosting, you know, Medicaid offices or, you know, being the uh, point in the community for uh, families to find childcare. Uh, nonprofits are actually working as the bridge to a lot of government services and programs. So I'm um, curious for your thoughts on, you know, you, you mentioned like a cabinet position. Have you seen any trends or things that you are in inspiring you towards that direction or, or things that you, <laughs> you You know, I have to say my experience of the last 10 years uh, working with this bill through Congress, it has made me realize that, you know, the status quo is, is really entrenched and you know, even the politicians that want to do the right thing, that their heart is really in the right place, they got elected for the right reasons, and they really want to make change are so uh, hampered by the system that they can't really do what they need to do the way the system is set up. I mean, you have to raise money to get elected. Who has money, right? Right. Um, and that's part of what we're finding in our own efforts to get this bill through. We're going through the banking committee and the financial services committee. Now, the Senator Brown has been very supportive. He's the chair of banking. But the point is, those people on those committees are not typically there because they're nonprofit champions. I mean, some are nonprofit champions, but that's not that's not the committees that they usually go through. But back to your, your bigger picture. I mean, we need a whole new way of looking at what success is in the world and in this country. What does it mean to have a good life? And I think that, you know, nonprofits at least are willing to examine that and say, you know, we're what what our current economic system has done has degraded so many people in their lives. 
it is not working. They have done their best to try to accommodate for the excesses of capitalism, but it's gotten to the point where I said, we can't really just nibble around the edges anymore and ask for more crumbs off the table. That this, it has to be a systematic change in how we look at what makes a good life. Mm. Have you seen any examples in the nonprofit sector, whether it's just different leaderships or organizations that have really pushed back against this status quo in a significant way? You know, um, <laughs> the, uh, I see, you know, various individuals, but it's, you know, it's, it's like my effort for the last 10 years pushing through the bureaucracy. You do make progress, but we have to have the numbers. We have to have, you know, a, a, a kind of a consciousness change. And I think if if I have, uh, you know, points of hope, it's really the direct action climate activists who are saying, we've tried really hard to work with you. You know, we've tried to go through the system. We've tried to get the laws changed. We've tried to get people elected. We have tried to follow your rules and look where it's gotten us. And I think they give me hope because as much as people say, well, they're disruptive and, you know, they're not, they're going to turn people off. I think they're taking a risk that is well worth taking. And um, it's the only thing that we have right now to get people to wake up. I, I sent a tweet uh, the other day um, that it, there was a tweet that was listing all of the chaos that's happening in the world these days. And I said, what will it take to wake people up? And that was like the most popular tweet I've sent in a long time. Well, part of the process of waking up um, is, as you mentioned, kind of the awakening of the consciousness of the sector, but also it can't just be nonprofits, right? It has to no. be uh, the communities, for-profit entities, the government as a whole. What are some ways that you see for-profit entities being part of this equation, uh, can they be in the capitalist model to really evolve and better support some of the change that we need to see in the sector as a yeah. whole? Well, I, I, you know, I think I see things from a different way, but, you know, when I see, you know, for-profit companies say, well, we really can't care about climate or doing the right thing for our communities because what about our shareholders? And I, and I just want to scream, you know, you will destroy the earth and all the creatures on it because you're worried about your stock price. I mean, that's the kind of thought that I think we need to be uh, getting the for-profits to think about. It's, they can't, again, that's where I'm saying there's so many of them doing so much greenwashing, so much around the edges. Oh, we're planting trees over here. I actually, when I see it in my own industry, I reach out to the associations or the companies that are doing it, and I reach out to them and say, what the heck are you doing, right? Why aren't you really doing more to um, take steps that are uh, valuable and hopeful? For example, in our industry, you know, there's so much investment in fossil fuels and insuring in fossil fuels. You know, Two decades ago, there were people in leadership that knew that. And they knew that the insurance industry almost single-handedly could turn this around if they didn't insure it and didn't invest in it. But there were just too many people thinking, well, I've got to send my kid to college. I can't possibly take this stand. And I think that has to stop. Mm -hmm. I mean, your, your kid in college is not going to have a future if you don't take the, the risk now. Right. It's um, really looking at the bottom line as more than just profit, but considering the, the purpose and the people and environment and everything. And we used to do that a lot more. I mean, it's not like uh, businesses always only thought of profit as being the only thing that was worth doing. There were, there were many, you know, up to the fifties, there were many people who very understood that there was responsibility to the community. But I will say, I, I just, you know, I just think the present model is not going to get us where we need to go. It's, I would like to think that people are gonna have ingenious solutions and that you know, capitalism is going to design all these fancy new technologies to, to get us where we need to go. But um, I'm one of those that believes that continuing to grow and have more and more and more 
is not possible. It, we have a limited earth. It's a wonderful earth. It's our planet, but it has limitations. And if we aren't willing to accept that, then uh, we will suffer the consequences. Hmm. Uh, I, I will say that, uh, you know, even like my experience and, and throughout my generation as a, uh, as a millennial going through the workspace, I've seen hmm. a lot more talk and ad advocacy around like ESGs and being environmentally conscious. Mm -hmm. I think it's there, but then I, I agree with you. Um, John Oliver, who has a show on yes. HBO, has a great episode about uh, the kind of carbon net, you know, the carbon, like net, car yeah, off, net zero. Net, yeah, net zero carbon, like how you can basically quote unquote offset what you're doing through planting trees or you know that that's just yes. it's that's all... nuts that's nuts that yes. that is just pure uh fantasy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well th yeah. i think people are waking up to that but then the bigger question is what are we doing is there any one like specific policy uh that you're currently lobbying for or one that you really want to see uh to have our government better support the nonprofit sector yeah. I think if we, you know, years ago, we t t tried to do this, it never happened. We need to have a price on carbon. I mean, we just have to have a, a and it has to be hefty. And if we don't do that, it's not, we're not going to have the right incentives. I mean, we're still, we're still subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, there have to be big changes and, you know, a, a absolute cost of carbon. Um, but, you know, it's a big world and there's a lot of resistance if, you know, everybody, I always say America always wants to lead until it comes to this. And I, you know, everybody, they're like, well, China's not or India's not. And I'm saying, well, America wants always to be a leader. Then let's do it in this too. Mm. Well, Pamela, you clearly have very defined uh, values around earth and being sustainable. And it's reflected in your, your business. I know the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance was listed as the best nonprofit insurance of 2023 by Investopedia. Uh, beyond like these values, or maybe it is like this stance that you take, what is it that's led to such strong retention uh, for you? Yeah, I honestly think it really is a true focus on the customer. We don't just say it is. I mean, there's no question our services struggled as we have these last three years doubled. I mean, it's been a very hard struggle to keep up service, but we really value our nonprofits. We love what they do. We um, appreciate all they're doing in their communities to help others. And we consider it our privilege to help them do that, you know, as best as possible. So um, I think, and, and also, you know, we have, for many, many years, we, we've divested of fossil fuels in 2011. I mean, we've we've been out of fossil fuels for a very long time. I've always had screens on our investments, even from the first million dollar loan. And, you know, we have a, a building that actually is net zero that we've built. So it's possible to do these things. Um, and, you know, we've given $50 million back in dividends to nonprofits. So in addition to the 250 million that we now have, we've given 50 million back. So it's not like we, we've competed in a for-profit environment, but we've been able to be sensitive to the environment and to others and the customer, and it hasn't hurt us. And I think, you know, if, if I have a, a legacy that I would like others to, to think of me, it is that, you know, I, I'm, I try my best to model a leadership of a different way of conducting business that was powered by loving kindness and respect for the earth and all its creatures. And it worked. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. Well, you Pamela, know? you answered the last couple of questions that I, I had usually on the show. Um, you know, one of which is what's a status quo that you'd like to sh see changed in the nonprofit sector? I think you've answered that one. And uh, what is it that you'd like your lasting legacy to be? And as I've been kind of reflecting in real time uh, throughout this conversation, one thing is apparent is that you do stand as a role model for what conscious leadership can look like. 
And I really admire how unafraid and uh, direct you are about your beliefs and views and the values in, in the world, even if like the direct work of the insurance of what you're doing, like isn't like so entangled with like the environmental movement, you're making that a big point. And uh, I admire that very much. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks, Pamela. Catch up later. Thank you. Bye-bye. I learned a lot about insurance and nonprofit sector, where it's been, how it's evolved, and where we are now. But the thing that really sticks out to me most from this conversation is the example that Pamela sets about what socially conscious leadership, sticking to your values, believing in yourself, and standing up for the greater good looks like. It's not for the faint of heart. It takes persistence and hard work. And in Pamela's case, over 10 years of that to see the change at the scale that matches the grandeur of her vision. Here's a quote to end our episode, this one from Confucius, among many great things. He said, it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. Thank you for listening. If you learned something new in this episode or other episodes of the Nonprofit Lab, please consider taking a moment to follow, like, subscribe, rate, and share our podcast with the friends, family, and folks in your network. It means a lot to us. And as always, be well.